the most powerful thing that we can do is keep fighting for that. This literally is a matter of life and death for so many young people who are dealing with these issues of identity. We're just going through our storm right now. The world will get out of it. I have faith. Climate change, our environmental crisis, all of that is what our generation is going to have to deal with. I tell you, my son was sitting in French class in a small college town, and he got shot four times. You feel like you're in the fight of your life, and they leave you on the battlefield alone. Oh, Never lose faith. Keep the faith. Her were doing bad things, and that's why she's there because she was actually with those kids. So basically, I lived in the home. I didn't sell these drugs, I didn't buy these drugs. I'm the girlfriend. Any crimes that he committed while we lived together, I was charged with. The minute she heard that door knock, and he said they had a warrant for her arrest, and I turned around and saw her, you know, hugging the kids. That was tough because she knew already. I want to try and tell your story, figure out a way to make something good out of all of this. Thank you, brother. I remember she always used to play with me and she used to comb my hair. The more I think about them, the more that those memories are slipping away. It has been tough for the last nine years without her being here. There are thousands and thousands of people just like her serving the same ridiculously insane sentences. She did not go to the police, so she was guilty. What we cannot wrap our heads around as a family, as her brother, as her children, is the sentence that she received. Missing my daughter's grow up. That's what I was sentenced to. I carry your heart, right? Mm-hmm, and I carry your heart. And now, HBO Documentary Films presents Queen of the World. in history has reigned longer, traveled further, or met as many of the world's people as Queen Elizabeth II. For seven decades, the Queen has crisscrossed the globe by land, sea, and air, bringing together her Commonwealth, an association of nations that were once part of the British Empire. And now, the Queen is passing the baton to the younger generation. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? Welcome. In this historic year, we've enjoyed privileged access to the Queen. I mean, it's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> and all her family, too. So nice to see it again. <laughs> we'll see them welcoming the world at home and flying the flag abroad with access to the Queen's private home movies. We've seen how she's inspired one generation and encouraged the next. And we've captured the excitement as a new Commonwealth journey begins. This is the British royal family on the global stage and the story of how Queen Elizabeth II has come to be seen by millions as simply Queen of the World.
The Queen is preparing for one of the highlights of her calendar, the recording of her annual Christmas message. Today we celebrate Christmas, which itself is sometimes described as a festival of the home. Families travel long distances to be together. Her message won't just be broadcast to people in Britain. It can be heard across the Commonwealth by 2.4 billion people in six continents, almost a third of the world's population. For many, the idea of home reaches beyond the physical building to a hometown or city. Excuse me, I can just ask, because there's some bird noise at the time, is it possible just to um, redo it from the top? Was from the top of the there? second page. From the very yes. start, from the very start. You want the whole but, thing again? If, if possible, I know it's... Thank you. In 2018, I will open my home to a different type of family. The leaders of the 52 nations of the Commonwealth, as they gather in the UK for a summit. The Commonwealth has an inspiring way of bringing people together. At the start of the Queen's reign in 1952, there were eight countries in the Commonwealth. Her Majesty the Queen comes to Westminster Hall for luncheon with 750 members of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. The Commonwealth is a free association of countries that were once part of the British Empire. It was created in 1949 by the Queen's father, King George VI to ensure a lasting relationship between Britain and its former colonies. There's a whole new conception, and it was a conception of equality for these countries. Though each nation is equal, the British monarch is retained as the Commonwealth's symbolic head, and the growth of the Commonwealth is something the Queen regards as one of her finest achievements across such a wide range of climates, uh, environments, everything, and lifestyles. And it's just extraordinary. It is the most extraordinary group of countries who are there because on the whole they share a history and they, and they actually quite like each other. That, that's, I said, quite like it. There are moments. <laughs> With the Gambia rejoining this year, there are now 53 countries in the Commonwealth. There are generations in, in the Commonwealth who've n never known anybody else as their kind of head of state. That's quite a remarkable position to be in. Every year the Queen hosts programmes that give opportunities to people from around the Commonwealth. The Caribbean Scholars Initiative brings rising stars in the hospitality industry for a six-week training programme with the Royal Household. Our Caribbean scholars are eight fabulous, fabulous young people. This very much was, was a, a, an attempt to reach out and see what more we can do to involve the Caribbean realms, uh, particularly in, in the Royal Household. So it's very, very special. Claudine Jeffrey has come from the Commonwealth island of Antigua. It's a fun place to work. I say it's an adventure every day because every day there's always something different. You never find that you're doing the same thing. So that's really amazing because I love a challenge and I don't like to be bored. I followed the Queen for a while and I remember watching her on TV and she was given a scholarship to a young man from my country and I was like well I wonder if I'm ever gonna get that opportunity and then you know to find myself in Buckingham Palace it's you know beyond my wildest imaginations. They are the embodiment is something she cares passionately about. Caribbean scholars are preparing for their first royal encounter. Hello, sir. Right, you are. First, I'd like to present Claudine Jeffrey. 
from Antigua and Barbuda. Nice How long have you been here now? Two weeks, going on three weeks. And you're here, all of you are here, all the way through till Ascot. Yes. Is that right? And you're all staying here as well. Yes. Have you got nice rooms? Yes, very comfortable. You're not all you're not all bunked in one room together. No, we're not. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> and parties every night. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, you guys, you guys have spent mm -hmm. way more time in Buckingham Palace than I ever have. <laughs> <laughs> and you've only been here for two weeks, I can assure you. Have you bumped into the Queen yet? Not yet. If you suddenly bump into her in the corridor, don't panic. <laughs> I know you will. We all do. <laughs> <laughs> The Queen has appointed Prince Harry as her Commonwealth Youth Ambassador. With his new wife Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, he's meeting young people from the Commonwealth. Sixty percent of the Commonwealth's 2.4 billion citizens are under 30. A lot of pressure on him in his role, um, being the youngest child, which I actually am as well. I understand there's always kind of that pressure that comes from being the youngest child. Um, people still look at you and you have to do something. But I think it's um, it's amazing how he's taking on that responsibility. Meghan Markle is the daughter of a black woman and she's entered the royal family. That gives me pride. She is going to become a symbol of hope and encouragement to many young women across the Commonwealth. And I'm inspired. I mean, there's some serious movement that's taking place in this country. And she's a big part of it. The Duchess of Sussex has already made a powerfully symbolic gesture. On the day of her wedding, and to the surprise of her husband-to-be, she had flowers representing each nation of the Commonwealth sewn into her veil. Today, Buckingham Palace has just received a special delivery. Here in the South Drawing Room, one of the world's most famous dresses is being unwrapped by conservators from the Royal Collection. It's a very privileged position to be able to handle and look after these objects with my team. It's kind of unique as well, I would say. And it's always an adventure, especially when it's a dress as beautiful as this. The dress and veil will be the star attractions in a new royal exhibition. Hopefully it will bring back some wonderful memories. But before all this goes on public display, the Duchess of Sussex is paying a special visit. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Fantastic. It is beautiful as you remember. Oh my goodness, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> the work that they did here is just so beautiful. This is the first time she's seen her dress since the wedding day. Wow. Beautiful. Somewhere in here, there's a piece of. Did you see it? The piece of blue fabric that's stitched inside. No. It's my something blue. It's my. It's oh, fabric my from God, my. It's still in there. Yes, well, that's sure that. that. It's fabric from the dress that I wore on our first date. <laughs> oh, that's about the most romantic thing. <laughs> Absolutely astonishing. All the embroidery of it, and the way it compares to your simple design on the dress as well. Thank you. Has been fun working on this. So much fun. It's just been a dream. Oh, it's great. Quite exciting. <laughs> Probably every girl's dream, but it's nice to see it again. <laughs> Her silk veil is 16 feet long, and the elaborate floral decoration 
took 500 hours to embroider. Each flower represents one of the 53 nations of the Commonwealth. I'm sure they told you the thinking behind, for me, including some sort of representation of all 53 of the Commonwealth countries, which yeah. was key, and I'd originally said to Claire Waitkeller, the designer, how can we incorporate that? Would it be the state flower, country flower of each place? And it was her idea to do wildflowers, which I think ended up being a really beautiful way to embody the feeling yeah. of it. Particularly, I think, the way they've worked out in three mm. dimensions. And got I want to stop right there in this particular program, and I realize to my viewers, they may be thinking, why in the world are you displaying this and you're supposed to be like a holy man or a teacher or some sort of spiritual guidance counselor. Why in the world are you showing us this for? I'm going to tell you why. It has only been since I have watched this program in understanding the power of the old British rule. Me and David used to sit around and talk about how that they still had influences over in the islands going towards Alaska. They still have influences over in Quebec, just north of Maine. They still have lots of other influences down towards, I believe it's old Mexico and South America. And I didn't realize that there was some sort of a connection because I had always been taught that the Commonwealth was in regard to a swing state or a split state during the Civil War. I am finding out that it's more to the Commonwealth states, there's four of them here in the United States that basically has their own rules and regulations. And in the front of this program, if you look and see again, it talks about how that this woman was basically sentenced not to watch your children grow up. While I was in the influences of various prisoners up in Kentucky being transported from one facility to another, I couldn't tell you the horror stories that I heard over people that was just something minute, something very, very small in regard to them pining and wasting their lives up into their jail system up in Kentucky. Similar to that in which what happened to me over me making two telephone calls to a group of people over in Land Between the Lakes that I had done already pre-warned the federal judge beforehand that I was going to be making my story known unto society. And whenever I say society, I'm just not talking about the Commonwealth society. I'm talking about society. They were so upset because I had made a telephone call a few minutes after my probation period had ended and then me waiting about another 90 days and making another telephone call, they went to the greatest of greatest extremes over putting the long arm of the law through a test by going and transporting Mr. Jackson, which is the individual speaking to you right now, from the state of Oklahoma back to the state of Kentucky simply over a telephone call that was non-threatening and in an apologetic form. They was going to be willing to send me off to, the, to a prison system one to five years over each charge, there was two charges, saying that I was telephone stalking 
these individuals up in land between the lakes. Once more, all I was doing was being very sympathetic to the cause of expressing to them that no, I'm not stalking. I've done already pre-warned and told. I've already given your federal judge an advisory by letting him know that because of these influences that you have violated my life on in regard to how that they taunted me, how that they was harassing me, how that they basically tried to set me up towards me being a homegrown terrorist in the regard of shutting down one of the, the western Kentucky uh, dams simply because they wanted to build another road structure further from that dam. They used me as a ploy to be able to get Congress to pass probably, I'm going to say, at least a $500 million grant to be able to build a road that used to go between Grand Rivers, Kentucky over to Benton, Kentucky. They used me as a ploy to say that I had threatened to bring destruction to one of their dams simply because I had made mention that God had showed me that there was going to be electrical disturbances to come. For some strange reason, they took it upon themselves, I guess, in thinking that I was going to create the electrical disturbance by blowing one of their, or possibly two of their dams up over in western Kentucky that costed me not only an evaluation in the Four Rivers Behavior Center over in the Mayfield, Kentucky area, but also costed me a five and a half month evaluation up in MCC in downtown Chicago. Then, on top of that, it costed me a period of nine and a half months after they arrested me in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, or outside Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma, and transported me back to Trigg County and got a bogus judge by the name of Woodall to pass a sentence upon to me. Not only did he pass that sentence upon to me to be evaluated again, but he also passed a sentence upon to me towards taking Risperdal, which is a known highly drug that causes obesity and breast enhancement. These people basically ruined my life over a non-threatening apologetic telephone call after, after me telling one of their federal judges that I was going to make my case known to the general public. And I have made it known through the Me Too movement. But I didn't understand until now what makes the state of Kentucky and other commonwealth states different in the United States? And it's this right here. The very thing that our, our forefathers was willing to put their lives on the line back during the Revolution War by saying we was not going to be ruled, we was not going to be dictated, we was not going to be dominated by any type of substance as this. And today, they still have major influences here in America. And if you don't believe it, you get in trouble in one of these states that's considered a commonwealth state and see what the heck happens to you pertaining to your rights and pertaining to how that they will basically 
try to literally ruin you over chewing gum and jaywalking. If they desire to want to go after an individual over jaywalking or chewing bubble gum, they'll so do it in the name of their own commonwealth judicial system laws. And I guess there ain't a damn thing that any attorney or any congressman or any law enforcement agency can do about it other than sit back and grin and bear it. I knew that I had run into something that was totally, totally out of kilter simply because of making a telephone call that was non-threatening and in an apologetic form. And it had reached a point that the public offender that had been issued out to me after all this was said and done with about a year later, she wound up getting away from being a public offender because she realized how badly that they had railroaded an individual, the very individual that's talking to you right now. And it, it, it really reached the plateau because David and her discussed it quite frequently while I was up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, being held by Trigg County, Kentucky. Once more, this is the same group of people that, that had shut down a dam. Shut down a dam because I used the word electrical disturbances. Shut down a dam, and WPSD went out there and recorded it, stopped the traffic, give or take about two or three hours, and brought diver dogs in and other types of special machinery to make sure that I had not planted any type of explosion device on their dams. They used me as a ploy because shortly after that, they got a grant from the state of Kentucky and they re-engineered a brand new road just north from that Kentucky dam that they shut down. By using the umbrella of safety concerns for the general public and they used me as a ploy to do it. Sad, but true. Sad, but true. I found out after being rearrested in 2012, the year that it flooded the Grand Ole Opry, that one of their barges had run up through the Tennessee River and hit a column of a major bridge there outside of Land Between the Lakes, in between Land Between the Lakes and Aurora, Kentucky, that took out a whole section that caused a calamity of the people that lived and or worked in LBL for a period of almost two years. Well, for a period of six months it caused a calamity towards them having to drive an extra 45 minutes to an hour just to get to their jobs if they lived on this side of the Tennessee River and then two years prior to that or two or three years prior to that they wound up spending another give or take 400 million dollars and rebuilt another bridge right beside that bridge and it wasn't until I think about a year ago whenever they demoed the old bridge down. I had no idea the influences of these commonwealth states or these commonwealth countries that are still in existence to this day. And this is, like I said earlier, the very thing that our forefathers was willing to put their lives 
on the table by saying we are not going to be subjected to this type of tyranny. And to this day, to this day, they still hold a great deal of power all over the world. Did you not hear what the woman said that whenever the queen made a Christmas announcement, give or take, about a third of the whole planet was subjected to hearing what she had to say? A third of the planet! Think about that for a second. A whole third of the planet is still under the subjection of British rule. Let's listen to just a little bit more of this and I'm going to let it go. Is there any way I can get home in time to open Parliament in London? Oh, that's very nice to see you. And the Royal Yachtsman made sure things ran smoothly. But behind those two doors were the screening of a cinema and the screening would come down here. Which I didn't like cowboy films, so I mean quite modern movies at the time. Now what you're seeing is the best of the best pertaining to the royalty of the richest of the rich. Naturally they're gonna show you the best side of them in some of these features. Behind the glass door there, the Rolls Royce, in the very early days, there's a huge problem getting it out of, out of here, as you could, you could see. But one of Britannia's greatest strengths was her draft, her depth below the waterline. Her designers had reduced it so that she could enter shallow ports. Now the Queen could reach parts of the Commonwealth that had never had a royal visit. The Royal Yard went to some really lovely places. Galapagos, Pitcairn, Easter Island. Places that uh, off the tourist track. Anywhere in the Pacific Islands, Tahiti, and uh, I don't know if you've heard of a place called Palmerston Island. So Manitoba. Gilbert and Ellis Islands, Easter Islands, the Marshall Islands, New Caledonia, Papua New Guinea. They were all fantastic places. Places when I joined the Navy, I never thought I'd ever get to. Wherever Britannia went, she made a big impression. Sierra Leone stands expectant as the Royal Yacht Britannia sails up the estuary to Freetown. She didn't come by, by plane, did she? Obviously, she came with a, she came with a ship. Fashion designer Euphemia Sidney Davis is originally from Sierra Leone. Tonight, she's been invited to Buckingham Palace. But first, her mother, Irene, is sharing her memories of the Queen's visit. So, oh, yeah, there she is. Uh, well, progress, and enthusiastically cheered all along the route. <laughs> We were given flags and we were told to line the streets. It was like she was coming from far away because we were in Freetown, never traveled before, and somebody was come all the way from England. So I remember we had to learn some songs for the Queen's Village. I don't know if you want me to sing that. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. Welcome to our glorious Queen. Welcome to Queen Elizabeth. Queen fine, beauty shine. Look where Prince Philip correct. In other words, you're saying the Queen welcome. The Queen is so beautiful. And as for Prince Philip, he is spotless, physically spotless. <laughs> and some of us we are hoping when we go older we have somebody as good looking as Prince Philip. You know? You'll get up there, you'll get up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 1991. Sierra Leone was beset by civil war. The war started and I saw no future for her and so I decided I must get out of here. I didn't see any future, so we left. Together, they traveled through three Commonwealth countries before seeking refuge in Britain. 
back home we have the saying, we want our children to go higher than us. So for me, she's gone higher. Tonight, the Queen has opened up Buckingham Palace for a Commonwealth fashion show, uniting top names and rising talent from across the Commonwealth. Well, it was lovely to see the palace looking slightly different because we had these fantastic mannequins dressed in these extraordinary different styles. Euphania has been selected to take part. For the first time, she'll showcase her work alongside some of the biggest names in fashion. I can't breathe. <laughs> I'm representing Sierra Leone and um, I wanted to be authentic to Sierra Leone and put something out there that is made in Sierra Leone. I am thrilled. And it's here in the palace. <laughs> the Queen has asked the younger generation to welcome the fashion world to the palace. <laughs> I hope they like what we've done. Anna Winter takes a look. I am honoured to meet you. I'm honoured to meet you as well. I follow you on Instagram. You do? You and so does Savile Row designer Oswald Vateng. I am incredibly proud to represent Serian. Leaving up as a young refugee, I always knew that I wanted to do something for my nation. And it doesn't get bigger than this. It really doesn't. And I'm not going to be biased in the degree of saying that everything that this entity serves under and for is all bad. Because they do have some very, very brilliant people that does great things pertaining to humanitarian needs over in their part of the world and their influences is to some extent very passionate and very sincere but naturally they're going to have to have that if they're going to try to redominate the world in the influences that they at one time had before our forefathers rose up during the Revolutionary War of the taxation of the tea and created a resistance movement in, in behalf of being against that type of rule. And if I'm wrong about the state of Kentucky in their legal practices and how they have been ingrained towards caring from one generation to another generation, I'll simply apologize. But whenever God led me up into land between the lakes, it wasn't so that I could defy the British rule, or the Queen, or the King, or any other pre-existing association that had ever left its mark here in the continental United States. My sole purpose of being led of God 
up into the land between the lakes area was because of all the suffering and all the sacrificing that had been made all in the name of modern progression towards TVA building the dams and flooding out not hundreds but thousands of people and eventually caused the whole continent of land between the lakes to be basically pre-existence from any type of human inhabitants. Any type of human inhabitants. And to this day you can go to land between the lakes and find one cemetery after another cemetery after another cemetery I think if I'm not mistaken there's about I think it's like in between 1700 and 2200 different cemeteries now granted some of the cemeteries may not have but three or four three or four people buried in them but some of those cemeteries may have as many as a thousand grave sites in that one cemetery it was a whole colony of people that basically had to sacrifice their lives so that you and I today could turn on electricity so that we could see one another in the dark. There has never been, that I know of, any type of monument built in honor of all the sacrificing that had occurred during that time between 1934 up until whenever the last stone got thrown which I think was 1963 and everybody was ordered off of the peninsula I think the last remaining one that that was forced to move that was a standoff was in 1971 or 1972. I may be wrong about some of my figures but the fact of the matter is there was a whole generation there was a whole pre-existence colony of people that was making LBL their homes and they was forced to have to readjust their lifestyles simply because of the mighty, simply because of the progression of today's society. And like I said, as far as I know, there's never been no great memorial or no great uh, nothing built in their honor in regard to the sacrifices that was made. Whenever we start forgetting the dead and our only conscience about our personal lives today, regardless whether it was sacrifices for modern progression, or sacrifices in wars whenever we start forgetting the dead is whenever we reach a state of resistance from the heavenly world that goes beyond anything that you and me can ever imagine sad how selfish and how forgetful that we have become in the 21st century and these characteristics are not natural because even the Commonwealth 
does in fact go to great lengths in remembering the sacrifices and the battles that their past has been through. I just wanted to share this with my viewers that way they can get some sort of a better ideal of what occurred in my personal life simply because that I had built a sacred site off of Legal Road 142 down by Sugar Bay that in my first ceremony that took place in 1989 I was privileged in being able to go through that, cer that ceremony in a whole 40 day period to the point of never having to move or be dismantled from that in which what God the Father had called me to do to begin with. Did I fast a whole 40 days and 40 nights? Absolutely not. I would fast sometimes 7 days, sometimes 11 days. But whenever I returned, I returned back to the same spot every time. Fasting and praying for God to not only sanctify the sword symbolizing peace on earth, but for God the Father to bless the endeavors that I was involved in to the extent of seeing a major revival or a revolution break out in the 21st century. Keep in mind, in 1989, I was still in the 20th century. I was coming through the latter parts of the 20th century in 1989. And that's whenever all hell busts loose in my life pertaining to Homeland Security up in Washington, D.C. And that's whenever the church world basically turned their backs on the Windmill Ministries missions. And that's whenever basically this country got turned upside down to the point that it is right now. I reattempted to do another ceremony in 2007 after spending a great deal of time in the southern states after Katrina had hit in, two, in November or October or September in 2005 I spent a great deal of time in the southern states before going back to Washington DC in 2006 pulling a supply wagon down the CNO Canal for a period of about 67 miles being stopped by Homeland Security there at White Bridge Ferry being investigated to make sure that I had no harmful intentions of me bringing the wagon that I was pulling with an empty sword box back to Washington DC hopefully, hopefully, to regain that sword. Once I identified that the sword was not going to be regained by various officials in Washington, D.C. in 2006 was whenever I went back to the southern states, remained in St. Augustine, Florida, working for a Wilson's auto body dealership there in St. Augustine, Florida, and in the spring of 2007, purchased another sword on St. John Street. This one had the insignias of the four horsemen on the handle. Went back up into Land Between the Lakes, and that's whenever all hell busts loose in my life towards the shutting down of a Kentucky dam and them trying to pronounce me as me being either crazy or trying to threaten them in some sort of way simply because I used the terminology of God had showed me that there was going to be major electrical disturbances. And sure enough, about a year and a half later, in January of 2009, 
there was in fact a ice storm like the state of Kentucky had never seen before that basically desecrated about 80, 76 or 72 counties, a little less than 80 counties, basically shut them down and put them to their knees, give or take for about three weeks. The governor had to put out a, a, a uh, act of, of an emergency, state of an emergency, to bring out the National Guard to make sure that uh, peace and order was established throughout that major event. But once more, I don't want to deviate from what I'm trying to tell my viewers right now, you the viewers, the fact that I had no idea until just now of watching this program about how influential the British rule pertaining to the Commonwealth countries, pertaining to the Commonwealth states, of how influential that they still are today. Today, even though we conquered them in the period of the Redcoats in the Revolution War. Thanks for listening. Good luck to all of us as we venture off into the year of the Jubilee in 2018. Good luck to each and every one of us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> are all the ladies wearing your clothes? I'm like, yeah, some are not paying. <laughs> The prince is due at the school in an hour's time. It's been quite hectic. <laughs> we want everything to look good. As they make the final touches, the teachers receive some bad news. Okay. Belly air quality is really poor right now and the government has ordered a shutdown of schools. And so we had to cancel the prince's visit to the school. But all is not lost. Six, On hearing about the school shutdown, the prince and his team have arranged a new venue where he can meet the children. I don't think they really know where they are going. All they know is that they are going somewhere. The children have arrived at the British Council building in the centre of Delhi. This is a once in a lifetime experience. Some of them never leave their home or school and that's the world for them. So, you know, to go to a massive big building, this is game changing. They've never seen this before. So, very excited for them. I think they'll come back home, talk to their parents, uh, share their stories. Yes. Yes. Maybe when you do, it's a very good, it's a very good book. When you become a king, you will build a fort. Will you build a fort? Like a king. Okay. Song, which the message uh, of the song is unity. We are all. We are all. Very good. <laughs> so how do you say we are all one in Hindu? 
I thought the children did marvelously well, and I'm so proud of them. I was simply bursting with pride. India's 1.2 billion citizens make up half of the entire Commonwealth population. But it's been nearly 10 years since an Indian Prime Minister has attended a Commonwealth summit. With an historic reunion soon to happen in London, the Queen has asked Prince Charles to pass on a personal invitation to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Buckingham Palace is getting ready for the start of the Commonwealth Summit. This is the first time in more than 20 years that the Commonwealth has met in Britain and the Queen has invited the leaders of all 53 countries to the palace. This is hugely special. Being a, a, a retired admiral, I'd say this is all hands on deck. This is a full ship's company effort. We've got the, the most beautiful gilt up from the, from the vaults and uh, you'll see the most wonderful display with, with 12 tables, 130 people sitting down, 53 heads of nation and their spouses. As the household prepares for the banquet, a special delivery has arrived at the gates. Just like the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth has its own crown jewels and the centerpiece is the precious and symbolic golden mace. The last time it was used in the UK was in Edinburgh in 92. Well, the Queen's got quite a large collection of silver and gilt. This just forms part of it. The mace is being transported to the state ballroom, where it will sit before the Queen at the opening ceremony. Does the the big end go that way or oh, so that way? Um, I can ask somebody from the door to something. I'd have to go onto Google and just look for a quick reference. Okay. The rehearsals for the official opening ceremony are now underway. The Prime Minister of Singapore. The Prime Minister of Canada. It's a great pleasure, a huge honour to be able to do that announcing. And I hope it didn't sound a bit too much like a game show host. As the final checks are made, there's an early arrival to see the Queen. The Prime Minister of India, Your Majesty. Her personal invitation to Prime Minister Modi has been accepted. We will first come later. Well, I'm very glad. <laughs> so, the last time I would not, but this time I made the point. No, that's <laughs> very kind. Yeah. Would you like some mixing? Please. is the most exciting day you can imagine. The Queen has invited the heads of government into her own home. You know, it's exciting for them, I think. They're really enjoying it. Judging by the atmosphere, it's, uh, it's great. We're all friends now. <laughs> <laughs> it is an extraordinary day to be here and to feel the connection. You know, there is a sense of family. Uh, to have that common ground, despite our many different circumstances, is something quite special. It was that very chatty, informal, relaxed atmosphere, and that really set the tone. <laughs> For the Queen, it's a chance to meet some new faces, and some familiar ones too. 
I think it was really poignant to think that she first met Justin Trudeau when he was a babe in arms. Quite a thing to be able to see a leader in that perspective. <laughs> Her Majesty has done an extraordinary job of uh, pulling us together and with challenges from time to time, but that's, uh, that's what a family's all about. Today the Queen has enlisted her family to help her shake hands with the world. <laughs> Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall greet the New Zealand Prime Minister. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Kits and Nevis is about to meet the Princess Royal. Good morning. I'm very nice to see you. While the Duke of York is expecting the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Nice to meet you. Hi. 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 Hi
go. The ending of this program. And like I said, if I have said something that isn't exactly true because of my lack of education, I pray that you will forgive me. Thanks again for listening to the Windmill Ministries Missions here at 291 Thompson Road, Chiron, Tennessee, zip code 38255. God bless and shalom. The world is a stage, a stage that God and God's precious people was to have planted a seed over 2,000 years ago, and in the planting of this seed, this seed was to have spread throughout every colony, throughout every tribe, throughout every continent on this great planet that we call Mother Earth. Because of the stifling of various people either in local, state, or federal government, it has created a handicap for the mission of the Windmill Ministries missions to get out and to go forth and to be self-sustainable that should have occurred in 1989. In other words, the devil in his resistance was so forceful they thought that they was going to be able to eliminate this grand juncture that was supposed to have been introduced to the world in regards to the first seal in the book of Revelations being opened. The individual speaking to you right now towards him being part of the orchestrator in that ministry that supports wide world utopia and peace to all nations, all countries, and all people. What has occurred here has turned out to be one of the biggest travesties that has ever happened in the world society known as the Americans. Various people who was a part of this conspiracy, who wanted to stifle the Word of God, who wanted to undermine God's people, if they are not held accountable to the fullest extent of the law in this lifetime, we promise, I repeat, we promise that in the lifetime to come, they will be held accountable for trying to stifle, hijack, and eliminate this message that was to have went out to the general public all over the world. Once more, we cannot say shalom enough in the year of the Jubilee because we know that there is hurting innocent lives all over the planet, not just here in America, but all over the planet of people that has been subjected to brutality, people that has been subjected to tyranny, people that has been subjected to... the existence 
of evil empires that has caused great remorse and great hardship in people's lives. May we as a society towards the homo sapiens up onto this planet never forget who our endeavored creator is and what he intended for all of us to be a part of for whenever he spoke of through his son Jesus Christ to go and feed my sheep to go and feed my sheep to go and feed my sheep he wasn't talking about feeding them monetary gain he wasn't talking about feeding them beans and potatoes he wasn't talking about feeding them unjustfulness and wickedness and barbaric heathenistic ways he was talking about feeding his sheep with the word of God through the creator who created all things through the existence of his son Jesus Christ of Nazareth he wanted us to be a part of that grand, glorious moment of watching the fullness of the harvest come about in the 21st century. In the 21st century. So may we as a Christian society always remember the sacrifices that has been made not only here in America but throughout the world of proclaiming that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten Son and that there is no other way for a human being to enter into the kingdom of God other than through the acceptance of Yahshua through the, through the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, that there's no other way of acceptance through and to the heavenly kingdom other than through the Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. May we forget our mistakes in the order of not wallowing around and throwing a pity party for each other and may we look forward to the adventures in the future of broadening our horizons in going where no man I repeat in going where no man has gone before thanks again for your time good luck to all of us as we venture into this 21st century and shalom under the wing of a B-52 bomber in an X-15, getting ready to launch. Trying to examine what drives someone to put their life at risk and to go to such great lengths and strive so much for something that seems so unattainable. Okay, on your way down. Altitude rising. You're bouncing off the atmosphere. It's hard to communicate just how dangerous and how extreme these missions really were. Without examining him as a person or examining his family, you wouldn't be able to understand the man. 
sort of nightmarish time in their life and it's juxtaposed with Neil's job which is so extreme as well so we meet them in a very critical and dangerous and emotional time in their life. Armstrong joins up to be an astronaut in the Gemini program at NASA. The Gemini missions were about learning how to work and function in, in space. The Soviets have beaten us at every single major space accomplishment. So we've chosen to focus on a job so difficult that the Russians are gonna have to start from scratch. As will we. He was constantly putting himself in the most terrifying life and death situations, but he was able to do it almost without breaking a sweat. They were essentially taking military ballistic missiles and replacing the nuclear payload with people. That grand cosmic adventure was fueled by things made by hand, rickety spacecrafts held together by rivets and wires, and piloted by people like Neil. So much that can go wrong is so much at stake. This was an insane proposition that took tremendous courage, cost a tremendous amount of money, cost many lives. This was not a cost-free venture, but nothing this momentous ever is. Damien really wanted to portray in a very real-time way all of these incredibly dangerous things. Well, I wanted the whole feel of the film to reflect what it must have felt like to be going on these missions, make you feel the claustrophobia. One of the things that I love about working with Damien is he is a true believer in giving people a ride, giving people a reason to come to the theaters. Damn, that is a big mother. And I wanted to really make the audience feel what it must have felt like to be hurled into space in these spacecrafts, how terrifying it was, how rickety these crafts were. It's to find a way to put the audience in the pilot seat so they can feel like they're launching into the air. like they're hovering in space. Then the camera is putting you there. You have the claustrophobia and the enormity. You can't believe that people survived and then going down a freeway, let alone going into outer space. The audience is there with you in the capsule. You understand how vulnerable they were. It was very much about trying to see what they see. Let's try for descent. Hear what they hear. Feel what they feel a POV driven first person almost kind of virtual reality version of 1960s space travel. Houston Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. When I was first cast in this, the thing I was most excited about was actually going to space camp. That was pretty crucial for me, to see the hallways and rooms where these people worked, to see the, some of the consoles are still there that they controlled missions from, and to see some of the spacecraft. We did these anti-gravity things and all these things that the astronauts do themselves. You can imagine if you just push hard enough, you probably go into orbit. <laughs> we saw where they were all training, seeing the Apollo 11 capsule, those visits to NASA, it was an opportunity that I still can't believe I, I got to have. The very first time you suit up, it's, it's intense. I mean, you know, you need help to get dressed. And of course, Florida, as you see those images your whole life, the launch pads and the big crawler, and to actually be there and see it and experience it in the way that we got to experience it was awesome. I really wanted to make sure everyone playing an astronaut in the movie got to see that. I think the greatest privileges I've ever had in this job is to get to go there and meet those people. We're very lucky to have a lot of help from NASA and the Air Force in terms of giving us access to locations, that helping us with research, helping us with archival materials. I've been in this business for 50 years. All of those people in flight suits with name tags and what they look like, it was really, really well done. I've been in the control center with family who's back at home in Houston. And then in the spacecraft, they did a hell of a job. Having these experts there that were talking us through it, we wanted to make it as accurate as possible. It's absolutely amazing. It looks so authentic. You can see the lunar module, see the guys come down the ladder, and you swear you're standing on the moon watching these guys. Move. Tonight we're shooting Neil Armstrong's descent down the ladder. Well, we decided to shoot the moon outdoors in a quarry that has very much the color and texture of the real moon. 
It had the idea, instead of shooting the moon on a stage, to shoot outdoors and shoot at night. Nathan has designed the moon, and the set is enormous. This is my first time landing on the moon. We need a great quarry, which is kind of rare. The locations actually found me a great quarry. They were willing to sculpt the landscape to our direction to look like the moon. The surface appears to be very, very fine red. There was a lot of pressure to get that right. And we're just trying to be as authentic as possible, but also trying to put a stamp on it that's unique to the movie. And we were shooting with IMAX cameras, and we were shooting with lights that Linus, our cinematographer, had created uh, to try and simulate sunlight. It's much bigger than any other moon sets ever. The natural challenges we've had is that it suddenly started to snow. It was a very, very surreal experience. I feel really insanely fortunate to have the cast that we do on this movie. If there's one guy in America to bring Neil Armstrong to life, it reminds you, man. Even before La La Land, I approached him about this role. It just seemed like a no-brainer to me. I think so often people want to overwhelm you with their emotion. It's the truly great craftsmen that know how to dispense it in a way that keeps you leaning in. Ryan is an actor who's able to do a tremendous amount without words, just with his eyes or with a look. And that's what I needed for this character. Ryan as a person is kind-hearted and generous and warm. And I think that's just naturally what he brings to the character. It's a fresh start. Are you sure? It'll be an adventure. I'm so grateful that Claire Foy played this role. She was such a huge help to me. A lot of our scenes were improvised because of the style that we shot the film in, this documentary style. What are the chances you're not coming back? Well, I can't give you an exact number. It's not zero, is it? Is it? People who knew the Armstrongs who would come by the set would sort of be gobsmacked for a second of, oh, is that, is that Janet? She entirely embodies Janet Armstrong at that era. I think Claire just does it so beautifully. I've got a dozen cameras on my front lawn, Deke. Do not me telling them what's going on? Jen, you have to trust us. We've got this under control. No, you don't. You're a bunch of boys. You don't have anything under control. It's an incredible ensemble. Everyone was so ready to go on this ride. There was a real enthusiasm from all the actors about what a special opportunity this was. I take my hat to Damien every single day. He didn't hold back. Incredibly complicated stuff, and he's just all over it. And that's what it takes. He knows what he's doing, and he gets everybody excited about it. You feel like you're invested in every part of it. I don't think I've ever had a director be quite so giving of the story to you. And action. I've only worked with Damien on La La Land and on this, but in both cases, the style came from the story, and it came from a sort of sense of what experience were you trying to create for the audience. This was about really trying to have you feel like you were there so that the audience could experience it that way as well. There's no grander story to tell than mankind's quest to go to the moon. Even more importantly, it's just the emotional story of a guy who's trying to be a father, who's trying to be a husband, while undergoing this kind of cosmic journey. This isn't just another trip, Neil. You're not just going to work. I think that the perspective that the film was shot from to put the audience in the pilot seat, but not just the missions, but also the Armstrong's life, that's a powerful point of view to experience. Where you feel like you go from the sort of Armstrong household all the way out to space, all the way out to the moon and back, where you feel that push and pull and you feel that variety of experience. We're coming to the end of our end of the year. Romita 200 Horizon! It's about him as a human being and what it means for a human being to make such extraordinary strides for humankind and what pushes them to put their life at risk for the rest of humanity. that it's such an unfathomable mission and for myself being someone that got to experience it in this very visceral way I'm excited for the audience to have the experience that I had